So you won't be able to progress very far in marketing without hearing someone talk about data, particularly big data. Uh, not really, by the way. Big data contains within it a slightly dangerous assumption, which is that more data is always better. Be a little bit careful of that, because when you have more data and when you have more variables, yes, your chance of generating truths and interesting insights goes up, but the amount of bullshit that's generated also increases and at an even faster rate. So problems like false correlations, for example, um, correlation is actually a very weak measure in many ways. Uh, also things like um, uh, what are occasionally called confounding variables. In other words, there's another variable which you don't have, which is causing the correlation. Uh, and which therefore leads people to assume causation when, of course, absolutely none exists and can, can cause people to intervene in the wrong place. Um, generally, um, there are some bits of good news. I don't want to come across as some sort of doomsayer about this, except to say that there is the potential with big data that there's mu there are far more data sets around than there are people who are statistically competent enough to analyse them. And so the potential for utterly insane conclusions being reached has actually gone up. The potential for really significant damage through a completely false interpretation of data, either by a machine or a human being. Because human beings aren't actually very good at statistics. That risk, and I would argue that the first thing you need to focus on is, do we have mechanisms for preventing really stupid from happening here? But there's good news as well. Behavioral data, which tends to be the kind of which we now have more and more, is, I think, more valuable and more significant than attitudinal data, for the simple reason that what people do is more revealing than what they claim they do. Um, and um, generally, by the way, the presence of all new forms of information is potentially useful and potentially valuable. Where everything can go dangerously wrong is, of course, using that data without a sufficiently questioning and cynical mentality. So I'll give you an example from totally personal experience, which is in my book, about how you have to be really cautious. Um, about 12 years ago, for some weird reason, I was given a fuel card by Ogilvy, which was a device with which I could buy uh, petrol for my car. And after having this card for about three years, the company that provided the card started doing something quite intelligent. It was reporting on my fuel economy. Now, to be honest, I think that was done for fleet managers rather than for my benefit. So you could have a real go at anybody who was obviously driving irresponsibly or generally trashing their car. But the reason they knew this data is that every time I bought the fuel, uh, I keyed in my current mileage into the um, keypad and then I put in the pin to pay. And so they had a link between fuel purchases and miles driven, and they could report on my fuel economy. Now, unfortunately, this data started driving me insane because every single month, the MPG of my car got worse and worse and worse. Now, at the beginning, it was quite a high level of MPG, and it just kept declining. And I became convinced for a time that someone was either stealing from my tank or that there was a leak or there was something significantly wrong with my car, which was causing it to use petrol in a less and less efficient way. And this drove me insane for about eight months, to a point where I was almost getting suspicious of my neighbours. Now, it turns out that two things had happened before I, the, the company had started presenting me with MPG data. One of which is I'd taken a brief trip to France, and you can't use the card in France. And on another occasion, I think, I, in the very early days, I'd forgotten to use the card. So there were two periods where, before the MPG data started being produced, my car was actually twice as economical as it really was, because I'd done twice the number of miles between visible fill-ups. And once I realised that's what it was, of course, I realised that actually what was happening was effectively sort of a form of regression to the mean. And I stopped being paranoid. But it would, be, would have been very, very easy for me to start lavishing accusations at my neighbour that they were siphoning fuel off, based simply on this data, without the understanding how one or two rogue variables, just one or two rogue variables which you don't notice, can cause 
um, information to go wonky. Averages are really dangerous because the average doesn't really exist. Um, I wrote about this recently in The Spectator. When they tried to design an average cockpit for high-speed jet pilots, the expert they brought in, who was a physical anthropologist, was already sceptical because he'd done work on the measurement of human hands and said that actually the number of human hands that are average across a range of dimensions is surprisingly few. Nearly everybody's hand is weird or an outlier on a few of these dimensions. And sure enough, they found the same was true of pilots' body type. And what they found was that uh, not a single pilot out of 4,000 was average across all 10 dimensions that they measured. And so his recommendation was, you don't need an average seat, you need an adjustable seat. And that you need adjustable controls so that depending on anomalies like the length of your forearm or the length of your legs or the width of your ass or whatever, you can actually adjust the seat accordingly because the solution for average is actually not a solution for everyone, it's a solution for nobody. And I think that's one thing we've got to be really careful of, that we tend to think that when we average, we're dealing with more numbers and therefore we have better information. Of course, when you average, you lose information because the very act of adding disguises things like variance, second order factors, which may be the more important thing. So other fears are there are a lot of people who are quite good at statistics, by which I mean bad enough to be confident, good enough to be confident that everything they think statistically is true, but bad enough to make real schoolboy errors. And th there are cases, I mean, this is a major problem when you're presenting evidence in court. Because even quite expert people, very famous case, the Sally Clark case uh, in the UK, where a solicitor was accused of double infanticide, when it was almost certainly a double cot death. And a doctor who was an Oxford professor, he was no slouch academically, went and basically said the odds that she is responsible for murdering at least one of her children uh, will basically multiply the odds of a double cot death together, square it, and then we'll subtract that incredibly unlikely um, uh, event from one. And the odds, therefore, that it was a double cot death were declared to be something like 80 million to one against. So essentially it said she's definitely a murderer, okay? Now, uh, it was appalling, by the way, because first of all, uh, they were both males, which increases the odds significantly. They were both children of the same mother and father. Now, if there's a genetic basis to cot death, which there probably is, that further reduces the odds. Uh, they were both in the same house. So if there were an environmental factor, like a strange sort of plastic material in their bedding, that could have been, again, uh, a common variable. But worse than that, in correct statistical practice, you don't compare the chance of a double, inf um, a double cot death against everything else. You have to compare it against the odds of a double infanticide. A double infanticide is really, really rare too. Once you make that comparison, the odds that she was a murderer are not actually 80 million to one against or whatever they were. I mean, you know, I, a, a near certain thing. Uh, the odds are actually something like two to one in her favor that she's innocent. I'll give you another example of misuse of statistics. Now, the reason I tell these stories is in lots of areas of maths, we can be a bit wrong, but our instincts aren't that bad. So if you ask me to calculate the surface area of a cone, okay, and you asked me to cut an area of cloth that would cover some sort of cone, simply instinctively, I'd be within an order of magnitude of the right answer, okay, you know, I'd be somewhere right, just using a hunch. With statistics, you can literally be wrong, as uh, I think the man's name was uh, Roy Meadows, Professor Roy Meadows was, you know, highly educated people with a room full of barristers, he was later censured by the Royal Statistical Society, but a whole room full of extraordinarily educated people can be wrong by a factor of millions because they don't understand what's going on. And a second case of this is the interesting misuse, sometimes called the prosecutor's fallacy, sometimes called the defender's fallacy, uh, in the O.J. Simpson case. Because previously, Mrs. Simpson had rung the police claiming her husband was beating her up. Okay? And the defence simply said... OK, uh, when we get people who ring up the police and say, um, my husband's beating me up, how often does that lead to a murder? And it was something like one in a thousand times. 
So they convinced the jury to regard that evidence as completely insignificant because it only added, you know, it only implied guilt at a level of, you know, 0.1%, okay? However, we've got to think about this differently because Mrs. Simpson was already dead. And if you reverse the question, when someone is murdered who has previously complained about abuse from a spouse, in what percentage of occasions was the spouse responsible for the murder? In those cases, it's significantly more than half. So you can literally be wrong by a factor of not fives or sixes, a factor of a thousand, and yet be completely confident in what you're saying and have really intelligent people not contradict you. So be really, really careful about statistics. I mean, a friend of mine, Ole Peters at the London Mathematical Laboratory, makes the point that all of economics is based on a fallacious understanding of probability, which is the assumption of ergodicity. Now, I won't go into this. Look up ergodicity because it's a whole area of discussion from theoretical physics to probability to um, economics now. But essentially, there's the assumption that um, what's good for 10 people doing something once is good for one person doing something 10 times in a row. So if 10 people do something once and it's good on average, therefore that's good for you to do 10 times in a row. Now, if I take a very exaggerated example, if I offered everybody watching this course uh, a million pounds to play Russian roulette once, okay, a few people would probably say yes, one in six chance of death, five in six chance of getting a million. There'd be quite a few people who go, I'll take those odds. Nobody's going to take almost any amount of money to play Russian roulette, say, six times in a row or 10 times in a row. There was one person, apparently, who would take a, um, a billion pounds to play Russian roulette 10 times in a row. Uh, you're almost certainly going to be dead. I would say that's a terribly bad bet, uh, even though on average, obviously, you end up richer. Um, and I've suddenly realized that using this misunderstanding of ergodicity has been really useful in problem solving, because you go in and say, you take a problem like train overcrowding, and they have a measure of you know, average number of people standing on a train. And my come in and I go, look, actually, you've got this wrong because you're trying to solve a problem in aggregate, which makes it into a monolithic problem, which makes it really hard to solve because you've got to solve the problem for everybody in order to solve the problem. And so you've got to solve the problem equally. I said, actually, what your model's assuming is that 10 people who have to stand 10% of the time is the same level of problem as one person who's got to stand 100% of the time. It's not, okay? You and I, all of us, when we use the tube, one time in 10 you have to stand, okay? Now, we file that under not the tube is fucking awful, I'm never gonna use it again. We file it under shit happens mentally, don't we? You know, okay, maybe there's a football match on there, more people traveling than usual. Hey, what crap happens? I'll just lean against the door instead. One person who always has to stand, if you can solve the problem for him, you've solved the bulk of the problem because you've solved the problem not for people who are irritated, doesn't matter. You've solved the problem for the small percentage of people who are insanely angry. And where you can solve that is on commuter trains. If you've got an annual season ticket, make first class bigger and allow annual season ticket holders to sit in first class on peak hours. Or run two trains a day, which are exclusively for season ticket holders between Tunbridge and Charing Cross. 